further fight, I, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. So Dr. Leah Mandelson is an assistant professor of engineering at uh, 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 Harvey Mott College. Dr. Mandelson holds her bachelor degree from uh, Olin College and her master and PhD degrees from uh, MIT, all in mechanical engineering. Uh, her research interests include unsteady aquatic uh, locomotion, bio-inspired mechanism design, uh, weak analysis methods for particle imager, uh, velocimetry data, and low-cost techniques for fluid flow measurements in both research and educational settings. Uh, her work on jumping archerfish has been featured by AIP Sidelight, MIT News, MIT Technology Review, uh, Inside JEB, Earth.com, and uh, ASME. Uh, at ha Huawei Mott College, Dr. Mandelson directs the flow imaging lab at Mott uh, and teaches classes in solid and uh, fluid mechanics and engineering design. Uh, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Leah Mandelson and learn from her. Uh, so Leah, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Sichang. It's great to be here and to see so many familiar and so many new faces here today. One of the bright spots of the Zoom era is definitely being a little easier to connect with so many colleagues online. Um, much of the work that I'm gonna be talking about today was done during my time at MIT. Um, but like many experimentalists who've been more or less shut out of our lab the past year, and we've also been digging into this data a bit more recently and able to draw some new conclusions and find some, some new insights even recently. Um, so the big idea of what I'm going to be talking about today is aquatic jumping. And so this is one of those things that like, if you've watched a nature documentary, you've probably seen something in this category where um, aquatic organisms that jump out of the water just as kind of an entire class of behaviors showcase a lot of extreme performance. It takes a lot of propulsive power and depending on that organism's goals for jumping, maybe a lot of accuracy or a lot of speed in order to pull off that behavior. And so aquatic jumping is something that's really interesting from kind of the surface tension dominated small plankton scale. Um, this is work from Sunny Jung's group looking at jumping strategies in plankton. And again, if you've ever watched an episode of Air Jaws, you've probably also uh, been transfixed by some sort of aquatic jumping behavior at the large scale, something like our three to five meter long shark scene here. So as engineers, this is an interesting class of behaviors as we start to think more about autonomous underwater vehicles and even aerial aquatic vehicles. Um, now that we don't need to put a pilot in every sort of underwater vehicle that we make, we can think about things that might have a wider maneuvering range, might pull some different G-forces or have some different trajectories. Um, and suddenly it becomes feasible to think about having vehicles that might operate in both water and air. And so any, an essential step during that operation process for these vehicles would be a strategy for that takeoff between the water and the air. Um, and how this is done currently is through things like either high pressure water jets, such as the example we see here, or your standard propellers. But if you think about some of the environments where you might want to use these aerial aquatic vehicles, maybe a really sensitive coastal environment, um, you probably don't want to be agitating it a ton, kind of blowing it up on your way out of the environment. Um, so there's a place where we might be able to find something, something better in nature to enable us to make that water to air transition. So the specific organism that I'm going to be talking about today is the archer fish. So situating these fish over kind of our mass and length scales, they're about 10 grams in weight and about 10 centimeters in length. So we're above the surface tension dominated scale that we would see with our plankton, but we're still small enough that this is a manageable specimen to look at in the lab. We don't really have to worry about keeping, ha having a shark on hand for these experiments. 
um, but they are large enough that they fall kind of outside of surface tension dominated jumping behaviors. So if you've seen an archer fish before, what you've probably seen it do is the behavior that it's named for, which is its ability to spit a jet of water out of its mouth to hit some prey that's some, some distance above the water's surface. And so when archer fish hunt using this technique, that prey falls into the water and they're able to then pursue it. So something I want to emphasize about the archer fish is that the reason why it has all of these sophisticated prey capture techniques, so it can spit, it's very fast at in-water pursuit, and as we've seen, it can jump, is because they live in a really competitive environment. So in this next video, what I want you to watch is this piece of prey up here, and then the prey is gonna hit the water somewhere around the middle of my screen. So our archer fish is gonna spit, it's gonna knock that prey into the water, and you'll notice that the fish that actually expended that energy to hunt, expended that energy to spit at the prey, wasn't actually the fish that got to then uh, eat the prey. So this is a case where instead, what we might see the archer fish do is actually jump up out of the water to capture that prey directly. So here the archer fish is jumping about twice its body length out of the water. And it's able to ensure that it's actually the fish that's able to then eat the prey. So before we get too deep into the hydrodynamics of this behavior, I do want to emphasize that this is a specialized swimming gait for the archer fish. It's not just taking its standard acceleration maneuver from when it's in water and using that in the air instead. So in water, archer fish accelerations are performed using sea starts. And the work by Wool and Schuster showed that they basically execute the same C start. So when they bend their body into the C shape and then uh, rapidly straighten it back out for both escape responses and for prey capture. Um, and some follow on work on in water prey capture and archer fish has also shown that they can steer and control the speed that they leave the C start with, with kind of the bending rate and the curvature of the body during this maneuver. Um, so this is not what the archer fish is doing when it's jumping. And this makes sense. We can think of a few reasons why a sea start wouldn't be a desirable swimming gait to use when jumping out of the water. I've mentioned before that this is a prey capture behavior, so it's really important that the fish is able to see where the prey is the entire time it's making that jump. It's also likely that our sea start is, since it's a full body maneuver, is less effective when half of it is in the air instead of in the water, since you're not pushing against the entire fluid domain. And again, the fish is doing this jump to be able to successfully capture prey. So if it's making really extreme displacements of its center of mass, um, when that fish is in and half in, half out of the water, you can think of kind of an inverted pendulum effect there. Um, there's definitely a greater likelihood of some, some instability. So breaking down this specialized jumping gait into a few key features, the first thing I want you to notice about this behavior is that it's initiated directly at the surface. The fish's snout is always either just a little bit above the free surface or directly below it. And it's in that position so that it can sight prey, it can aim. But this isn't a jumping behavior where there's any burst swimming that happens beforehand. If we look at kinematics right around jump onset, we see there's your kind of characteristic traveling wave kinematics of the fish, but then there's some activity from additional fins as well. So we see that the pectoral fins, for instance, are, are abducting and adducting, so extending outward and inward during this jump initiation. 
The next thing I want you to notice, as mentioned before, is that this is a primarily vertical jump. So the fish isn't really moving side to side a ton. It's basically eyes on the prize the entire time going out of the water. And in a kinematic study, we also found that this behavior is very accurate. So over 70% of the time, over the course of about 100 jumps in five fish, we were able to observe the fish successfully reaching its prey. So for the remainder of this seminar, I'm gonna be talking about work in three main areas, looking at the archer fish. So first I wanna talk a little bit more about this jumping prey capture behavior, some of the kinematic trends that we've seen, as well as some work looking at the hydrodynamics of how this fish is using all of its fins that we did using some two-dimensional particle image velocimetry. Next, we're gonna take a brief detour into talking a little more about 3D PIV techniques and experimental methods, and specifically how I built a 3D PIV system that we could use for near body and near free surface measurements, which we'll see is really crucial to being able to understand what's going on with some of the archerfish's fins. And then we'll talk in more detail about some of the insights from using this measurement system on archerfish, looking at fin interactions, what instantaneous and cumulative propulsion looks like in this fish. And we'll finish by looking a little bit at the pectoral fins in particular. So to get us started here, I want to talk a little more about kind of the kinematic behavior of this fish and what it's doing that's responsible for the high performance accelerations and extreme accuracy that it's able to achieve. So in this kinematic study, what we set out to do was look for input and output behaviors primarily with the tail kinematics. So we're keeping track of uh, what we've called tail strokes, where one tail stroke is a peak to peak motion of the caudal fin. And we've counted strokes in this way because it gives us a little finer resolution rather than counting full um, 360 degree sinusoid tail beat cycles. Um, we did this for five fish and had about 98 or so almost 100 total jumps in the data set. Uh, this work was all done using high-speed imaging, and we varied the bait height between a quarter of the fish's body length and two and a half times the fish's body length above the surface, measuring relationships between the bait and jump height, the trajectory of the snout, as well as the amplitudes and durations of all of these tail strokes. So one of the first things we found with this kinematic study relates again to the accuracy, where we found that the jump height that the fish achieves as measured from the snout is very closely matched to the bait height, but it's usually a little bit higher. So this fish is more likely to overshoot than undershoot. Um, we didn't really push our range of target prey height so high that the fish couldn't reach it. Um, and you can think of why it's probably better for the fish to slightly overshoot than slightly undershoot to ensure that it does actually have a really secure grasp on the prey at the end of this jump. A second confirmation from this kinematic study is that the aerial stage is ballistic. So if you think back to the first video you saw, like the fish wasn't completely motionless when it was out of the water. It did kind of still, still shake off a little water, reorient itself a little bit. Um, but what we found by measuring the kinetic energy at the moment when it completely clears the free surface and the change in gravitational potential energy when we reach the maximum height of the fish, is that that aerial stage is approximately ballistic. So our initial kinetic energy matches our total potential energy. 
So this isn't something like a flying fish where you are actually producing forces in the air. So looking at how the fish sets that exit velocity before it leaves the water, what we found is that these tail beats we can think of as basically a discrete unit of propulsion. So each time the fish is flapping its tail back and forth is going to correlate linearly with an increase in the jump height that it's achieved. So it, if it's trying to jump higher, it flaps its tail more times before it leaves the water. But the interesting thing in here is that even though we have this nice, clean, linear relationship, what the fish is doing during each of these tail beats isn't uniform. So this is not some sort of constant amplitude flapping motion like what you would see a lot of the time if a fish is just swimming in kind of an infinite fluid quiescent domain. Our tail strokes start out at kind of a higher amplitude, peaking after the first few tail strokes and then decaying off as we approach the surface. And if you look at the motion envelope on the midline data of the fish, you see this as well, where we have much wider motion envelope that really kind of tapers to a point as we reach the surface. And then again, in the aerial phase, we do see some, some reorienting of the body, some, some thrashing of the fish and going back to some, some larger amplitude motions that don't actually contribute any thrust. So our tail strokes are a discrete but non-uniform way of thinking about this propulsion. In this kinematic study, we really focused on input-output relationships with the tail. But if we go back to our original high-speed imaging, it's pretty clear that this isn't just a tail-driven gate. So if we look at what's going on using high-speed imaging, we have activity from the caudal fin, as I've mentioned before. But we also see the same traveling body wave moving through the anal fin. So this is the large fin on the underbelly of the fish and the dorsal fin. So that's your jaws fin on the back of the fish, as well as from the pectoral fins, which are sort of the arms of the fish that uh, sweep out and then kind of down as we go through this jumping behavior. If instead of looking at high-speed images, we look at morphology, we see a lot of motivation for wanting to consider multiple fins in this scenario as well, where what we see is that the median fins, so the anal fin and the dorsal fin, are very close to the tail and have comparable surface areas. So if you think of your force producing ability as proportional to area, it seems likely that we would have some contribution, especially from the anal fin, because it is as large area-wise as the tail. And then the archer fish also has a lot of the fin features that have been shown to give really fine scale control. So fin rays enable the archer fish to control the, the curvature of these fins and spines and so the thicker rays at the front of the fin give the archer fish the ability to control how flat against the body or extended these fins are. And we see that during the jump, these fins are extended. So since we're thinking about multiple fins here and the hydrodynamics of them, we're going to approach that problem using a few different particle image velocimetry experiments where the first thing we tried was a pretty standard 2D PIV experiment. So we have a laser sheet below the tank. And something I wanna highlight about this experiment setup is that the wavelength of this laser is in the near IR range. So this actually proved to be really crucial to doing a lot of PIV work on fish because 
like humans, archer fish can't see near IR. There are some, some weird species of deep sea fish that are capable of seeing IR, but fortunately those aren't what we're studying here. And so we're able to illuminate the PIV experiment um, basically without the fish knowing that it's being watched. So it behaves a lot more naturally than if we tried to use your kind of classic green PIV laser in this experiment, in which case, since archer fish are really visually sophisticated, that's how they do all this aiming. We probably would have just had a bunch of data of the fish running away from the laser, which isn't what we're really going for here. And then in the rest of the PIV setup, we have a controlled bait height, a high speed camera looking basically at the ventral plane of the fish. So looking at the, the underbelly of the fish and our light sheet is aligned so that we capture some combination of the caudal fin or the anal fin or the dorsal fin and or the pectoral fins. So what this data looks like, we get good resolution of the flow motion at jump onset. You could see we were picking up a starting vortex there and we're able to capture some of the flow features produced by these fins. However, there were also a lot of limitations to these 2D PIV experiments. So since what we're really interested in here was the contributions of all the fins and not just the contributions of the tail, we need to be able to image multiple locations on the body, ideally simultaneously. So here we had to do a lot of different trials to capture the, the caudal fin wake as well as the anal fin wake. In some cases, because the fish would travel in and out of the light sheet as it continues to jump, wake features would show up in the measurement that you couldn't 100% pinpoint where they came from. So sometimes there was an ambiguous flow feature or an ambiguous interaction where you couldn't actually tie it back to a specific kinematic action. And again, since this is a live animal, we're not doing this with a mechanical recreation of the fish. It was nearly impossible to get the fish exactly where you want it within that 2D PIV light sheet. And so the solution that lends itself to resolving all of these experiment challenges is to instead perform three-dimensional volumetric measurements on the archer fish. So at the start of this talk, I mentioned that we were going to take a brief detour from fish in the middle to talk a little more about 3D PIV techniques and specific changes to um, the, the standard 3D PIV technique used in, in our lab to facilitate studying jumping archer fish. So we're going to to move into that section of the talk now. The underlying principle behind the 3D PIV technique that I use is synthetic aperture refocusing. And we can think of synthetic aperture refocusing as basically simulating the effect of a camera with a really narrow depth of field scanning through our measurement volume. So if I have two particles in some hypothetical measurement volume and they're found at two different depths within that volume, so here we have particles A and B, and I image those with a camera array, so this is a multi-viewpoint technique, the pattern of those two particles is going to be slightly different on each of these, these source images. If we map each of these cameras to a global coordinate system, so using some sort of calibration target, and then warp all of the images as though all of the features in that image are found at a specific depth, we can then average the images from all of our nine cameras in this case. And what we'll see is that where that particle is actually found, that 
that set of warped images will converge. So we have this nice, bright, coherent particle here at Z1 and a similar one at Z2. Whereas if our particle isn't actually found at that depth, instead we'll get this constellation sort of shape that's roughly in the arrangement of the cameras of our array, and it will be much lower in intensity. And so initial synthetic aperture refocusing experiments done by, done by Jesse Belden and a few others showed that you could remove this low intensity kind of background, um, what we've called a discrete blur via some sort of intensity thresholding. So we've, we've done a lot of work looking specifically at applying this synthetic aperture particle image velocimetry technique to fish. And what that implementation typically looks like is we have a camera array viewing our tank where we'll see that the number and configuration of that camera array is, is open to some redesign. We now have a volumetric near infrared laser illuminating our measurement volume, which was often the, the median fins of the archer fish. And all this work is done in just a standard five to 10 gallon fish tank with pretty standard polyamide tracer particles. And one reason why we were so interested in using synthetic aperture particle image velocimetry for this jumping fish problem is that algorithmically, it's possible to reconstruct particles, even if they're partially occluded. So by partially occluded, I mean, you might be able to see the particle in some of the cameras. So maybe I can see it in the left or right side cameras, but not in all of the cameras. And this algorithm, because it's non-iterative, unlike um, MART and what you might have seen for tomographic PIV, it's very fast and GPU parallelizable. So if you want to process a lot of time-resolved data, you can do that within the time scale of a PhD using this technique. So we did a lot of the SAPIV technique development for fish on giant Danio. So when I say giant, I mean uh, centimeters instead of uh, instead of millimeters long here. So giant Danio are basically slightly larger zebrafish. And this is a fish that's been used in particle image velocimetry studies of fish swimming for a long time. So if you want to think of zebrafish as sort of a, a model organism in the fish a set of species, you can think of the giant Danio as sort of a hydrodynamic model organism where it shares a lot of those attributes, but it's a little larger and a little easier to image. And so we demonstrated that we could use synthetic aperture PIV to resolve both um, sort of Carmen Street style wake structures during forward swimming, as well as time resolved measurements. So here you're looking at a 50 degree turn that the fish is executing. So we've, we've demonstrated that this technique is able to resolve fish wakes satisfactorily for the type of problems we want to look at. A few fish specific things that we need this experiment technique to be able to do. We need to be able to separate the body from the tracer particles. And this is important both to have some sense of where the body is in the flow, as well as to ensure that anywhere where we have, say, a body reflection or body motion, that body motion isn't uh, corrupting our flow velocity field. When we do our cross correlation for our PIV, we want to only be measuring the particles. So we do this segmentation of the body using the visual hull method, which was developed by uh, Deepak Adhikari and Ellen Longmire originally for tomographic PIV. And what the visual hull method does is it takes a set of binary images where each image shows 
the uh, location of the fish body in that particular image. And then we refocus all of those binary images over the same range of focal planes, so the same range of depths that we were using for our particle field reconstruction. So you see that at negative two millimeters here, we get one of the tips of the tail. At six millimeters, we get the other tip of the tail and we're starting to get some of the caudal peduncle and getting into the body of the fish. And then we get more of the body and the rest of the caudal peduncle at a depth of 14 millimeters. So this gives us this region of the flow field that is entirely body where we aren't going to have any measurements. Something I want to point out about the visual hole is that it's also includes what's known as the shadow of the visual hole. So you'll notice that this is tapering to a point here. And so we know that the fish isn't actually that thick, but what the shadow represents is the region of the flow field where we still have body information in all of our cameras and therefore, we're not going to capture any particles, even though it's not actually where our fish physically is. So since the visual hole is an overestimate of where the fish body is, it's very helpful to also do some pointwise tracking of different locations on the fish body. This is what's also going to enable us to map some of the kinematics and hydrodynamics that we're going to look at later. And so to do that body feature tracking, we first do some image processing to remove particles from our images. And then we track the body points in some subset of our camera array. So in this case, just using the outermost cameras because there's not really any advantage to using more. And then if we back project all of these points that we've tracked, taking into account the refractive interface of the water, so we're not using a linear transformation here, we're actually propagating this through the refractive interface, um, we can determine our 3D position and our kinematics. So here we see we get good resolution of the caudal fin orientation and the amplitude and orientation of the tail beats as well as the trajectory of the anal fin. And in this case, we also tracked the, the pelvic fin, which is the other smaller fish fin on the body. So thus far, I've been talking about general fish implementation of the SAPIV technique. But we had to go a little bit beyond just that standard fish-like setup to look at the jumping problem because we had a few additional constraints. So first, it's really only useful to measure the hydrodynamics of this behavior if we can relate it to performance. So we needed to be able to keep track of the aerial trajectory of the fish. So this basically required reallocating a couple cameras from our underwater viewpoints to our aerial viewpoints. And second, we want to be able to make these measurements really close to the free surface. And so we want to make sure that our cameras are still viewing our measurement volume through the side tank wall and not kind of top down looking at the free surface because reflections at the surface will limit our ability to, to reconstruct really close to the free surface. So what this meant in implementation was that we had limited vertical spacing for the cameras that we were going to be using for PIV, as well as fewer cameras. So in hardware, what this looks like is what you might imagine for a rat's nest of cables and wires and nine high-speed cameras staring at this 10 gallon fish tank where our bait is suspended through the, the hole on the top of the tank and we're imaging through this side tank wall into the fluid medium. But making this camera configuration change as well as what I've mentioned previously about having a fish body and lots of occlusion 
in our measurement domain is going to impact how we reconstruct tracer particles in order to actually make our flow measurement. So to get a sense of how big of a problem this was, I want to look at an example where the visual hull is constructed using the seven camera array system. And I want to apologize if there's some, some weird display effects happening here. I can't tell whether it's on my side or on the screen share side, so I apologize if things are a little weird. Um, but what you should see on this slide is that we have a lot of partial occlusion. So we have our region that's body in all of the images, and that's what becomes our visual hull. But then we have this much larger region where over half of our cameras are occluded. And this is really important for the Archerfish problem because as I mentioned before, what we want to characterize is really fin interactions and multi-fin behaviors. So we want to get the best measurement near the fins that we can in order to do that. The second thing I want to highlight here is that our standard warp average and then threshold out the low intensity particles doesn't necessarily lend itself to reconstructing partially occluded particles. So in this example, we've got three particles here at two different depths, so two different planes within our measurement volume. And in my first particle, it's in view for all of the cameras. So it's going to be in focus and really bright where here I'm using inverted intensities so that you see things and it's a little easier to project. And then we'll see our discrete blur pattern where that particle doesn't actually exist. Our third particle, however, is partially occluded. And what we see here is that when that particle is in focus, since it's only in three cameras, it's a lot dimmer. And in some cases, it's comparable dimness to this discrete blur pattern. So using just this standard intensity thresholding, we're really likely to accidentally eliminate the partially occluded near body particles that we really care about to make these measurements. And so we took a look at this a little more probabilistically to figure out how big of a problem this was going to be in our measurements. So we varied the total number of cameras in our experiment, as well as the number of cameras that would contribute to that sort of coincidental overlap of particles that we consider a ghost particle. So this is a false particle when two discrete blur patterns converge. And we also varied the source density. So how many particles are in our image to begin with? over a range of source densities that's representative of our experiment. And what we found was that we were much more likely to have ghost particles from one or two cameras, which isn't surprising, than that coincidental overlap that leads to a brighter ghost particle. But within our range of experiments, we could expect this to be a problem. So we set our cutoff at we want no more than 10% uh, as many ghost particles as true particles in our measurement volume. And we found that we were likely to have some similar intensities between partially occluded particles and ghost particles. And so the way that we ended up overcoming this limitation was to look at some different non-iterative algorithms for particle reconstruction. And so these non-iterative algorithms typically require all of our cameras to successfully reconstruct a particle where the minimum line of sight warps all of our images and takes whatever the minimum value is as our true value. 
and the multiplicative line of sight takes the product of all of those images as the total reconstructed value. So if we have any images that don't view a particle, either of these is going to zero out. However, we can actually implement the minimum line of sight here if we make a couple changes to how we handle the mask during PIV reconstruction. Where the most notable change here is that we're going to flood the mask region instead of blacking it out. And we're going to make sure that our intensity is really normalized around the rest of the image. So in implementation, what this looks like is if we start with our raw image and our binary mask of where the fish body is in that image, we'll take both a bright masked version of the particles for uh, reconstructing our particle volume for PIV. And when we refocus that, we see that we do have particles right up till the body. Unsurprisingly, by having fewer cameras, we also increase our likelihood of having, having a little more noise there, but we do have particles all the way up to the body. And we'll also map out our partial occlusions as I showed before. So keeping track of the number of cameras that see a location versus the number of cameras that can't see a location. And we'll set some cutoff for what is an acceptable number of cameras seeing a location. Um, here we use slightly greater than half. And so what this does is it gives us a particle volume where our overly occluded regions still get masked out, but then we do maintain more near body particles at comparable intensity to the other particles than we would with that warp average and threshold algorithm that I first introduced you to. So putting all these measurement pieces together, I'm going to use an example here that's a 1.7 body length jump by our archer fish. And the video I'm showing here is what our center camera is seeing. So it initiates the jump, you see the particle motion, and then the fish leaves the measurement volume. And what our measurement technique resolves here is we capture that starting vortex and the following tail beats, as well as a simultaneous three-dimensional trajectory as the fish makes its way out of the water. And if we continue our motion tracking as the fish is in the air, we're able to basically capture the mouth opening and then the mouth closing on the prey. So breaking down some of the wake features that we're able to resolve and look at here, we have the starting vortex ring from the caudal fin, and we're able to look at the trajectories of the caudal peduncle and the anal fin as well. As we continue onward, we resolve the dorsal and anal fin wakes. We resolve the dorsal and anal fin wakes again during the next tail beat, as well as the interaction of the tail with the previous wake structures. And what we get at the end is something that looks a lot like a reverse Carmen Street. So the pattern you would see in forward fish locomotion with some variation in the orientation and size of each vortex ring. In this example, you also see that the anal and dorsal fin wakes often get incorporated into the main vortex street. But in just a moment, I'm gonna show you that that's not always the case. So to finish up here today, I want to take a look at some of the insights into fin interactions and fin utilization that our measurement techniques enabled and how that relates to different strategies the archer fish might be using for jump control. To ensure that all of our flow measurement variations are due to some difference in kinematics or behavior and not just a difference in morphology, we narrowed this study to a single fish, which makes sense for bio-inspired design where it's okay to have an exceptional specimen or have a characteristic specimen that you're using. But I wanna highlight that this anything I'm presenting here shouldn't be considered definitive comparative biomechanics because we did narrow our focus to just one specimen. 
But what we did find out about this specimen is that it's very similar to all of the specimen we did our 2D kinematic study on before. We still have jump heights slightly above bait heights. It overshot in a very similar frequency to our previous fish. And we still had a linear relationship between the number of tail beats and the jump height. Looking at the morphology of this fish, it's about seven centimeters long, weighs a little over seven grams, and the caudal and anal fins are of relatively comparable surface area. Um, we were unable to measure the dorsal fin area very accurately um, because this did become a preserved specimen and the dorsal fin didn't make it through preservation super well, um, but we were also able to measure the, the pelvic fin. Something else that going three-dimensional enabled us to do was look at how fish angle their bodies when they're actually doing that aiming step. So this was a well-documented behavior during spitting where the fish's body posture is what aims the jet. It's not aiming with its mouth. Um, like if you think of this as drinking from a straw, that's not how it's controlling where the flow goes. It's actually reorienting its body. So we wanted to see if this happens during jumping as well. And what we found with our 3D study specimen is that it does. The archer fish's aiming posture gets steeper, so it gets closer to vertical with the surface as the target bait height increases. So in addition to everything I've previously mentioned about time during a jump and target height, we can also see from our 3D measurements that this aiming body angle is going to have hydrodynamic implications. Where if we think about this initial low posture and looking at the trajectories of our caudal and anal fins, there's really not much overlap in their trajectories. And the tail's oriented kind of sideways to start while the anal fin is oriented more downward. Whereas if we look at a higher bait height case, we see a lot more overlap and a lot more similarity between our caudal and anal fin trajectories. And so what we found is that when we consider aim as well as timing during a jump and target height, that the archer fish was actually exhibiting three distinct modes of caudal and anal fin interaction during the jump. So we found that both of these fins could produce thrust and counteracting lateral forces without any sort of interaction. We also found that they could produce supplementary forces, so both thrust and lateral forces in the same direction, as well as having some fin-fin interaction during the next tail beat. But we also found that we could have these supplementary forces without any sort of fin-fin interaction as well. So we found three modes of caudal and anal fin interaction. So for each of these modes, I'm going to briefly show you what the kinematics and wake patterns of that mode looks like. So for the first mode, this is our thrust and counteracting lateral forces without any sort of follow on tail beat interaction. We see that our caudal fin is initially oriented sort of at about a 45 degree angle from the vertical, and then it becomes oriented more to produce vertical flow as the jump progresses. And our anal fin has a lower amplitude motion. And I also wanna point out that the anterior region of the anal fin is actually moving opposite the posterior region and the tail in its initial direction. So what the wake pattern during this behavior looks like is we pick up the starting vortex from the caudal fin, the wake of the second tail beat, as well as an additional wake structure from the anal fin. So taking a few stills here to break this down because I know the previous video was fast. We see that at the end of the first tail stroke, we have the caudal fin wake as well as a separate vortex along the span of the anal fin. And then at the end of the second tail beat, we have this second vortex ring but we still have this persistent vortex from the first anal fin stroke that doesn't get incorporated into that caudal fin wake. 
And if we slice this up a little more, we see that as well, where we have our initial thrust jet from the caudal fin, which again is at kind of a almost 45 degree angle with vertical, so it's not exclusively producing upward thrust. Where here we think of our thrust direction is always vertical because that's the direction the fish wants to go. And our anal fin is actually producing a much more vertical rate wake. And then again here we see that at the end of the second tail beat we get close to that anal fin wake, but it's still there and it's still persistent as an independent wake structure. So we don't have a complete fin interaction in this case. And the anal fin is actually more vertical than the caudal fin here. The second interaction we observed was supplementary caudal and anal fin forces with some interaction in the next tail beat. So we saw this when the body had a higher initial posture and was trying to reach a higher height. And if we look at the kinematics here, where I'm tracking the lateral position of each of these points on the fish body, um, the two observations I want you to see is that the ventral side of the caudal fin is leaving the dorsal side in phase. So this is actually the opposite of some asymmetries that have been seen in other species of fish, but suggests that there's more advantage to the anal fin side, the ventral side having a higher amplitude because it has all this additional surface area to produce thrust width. And the other interesting thing to see from the kinematics is that the phase difference between the posterior anal fin and the tail is very similar to what's been reproduced in mechanical systems of tandem hydrofoils of similar spacing, so similar proximity to each other, where you do see a high thrust pattern from the second hydrofoil, or in this case, the tail. At a, at a similar phase lag to what you're seeing here, as well as a merged thrust jet from the combination of the two fins behind the second propulsor. So taking a look at this case, you can see the jets coming off of the dorsal and anal fin, and then the caudal fin basically sweeping right through them as it proceeds. And if we break this down a little more step-by-step, step, what you see is that we have the wakes of the dorsal and the anal fins here. And we have that during both the first and second tail strokes. And in this case, our second tail beat here has basically moved directly through where our dorsal and anal fin wakes previously were. And we actually detected some, some lateral flow reversal here. So the caudal fin has changed the direction of the dorsal and anal fin wakes. And we saw the same thing again during the third tail stroke as well as the second. So this fits really nicely into the, the literature on how the dorsal and anal fin wakes can strengthen the caudal fin thrust by either enhancing the, the leading edge vortex, um, reversing the direction of flow in an earlier wake structure in general has been connected to thrust enhancement. Um, but we didn't see the same sort of flow redirection in the first mode. So this is, this is a different interaction. So for the third case, I'm not going to walk you through the kinematics again because they're approximately the same. Um, but what we see here is, again, a case where we can have a persistent separate anal fin wake. In this case, this is happening late enough in the jump that the fish has a lot of upward velocity and it basically bypasses that wake structure before it executes its next tail beat. Um, so here you see the anal fin wake from the second propulsive stroke. And we see that the third tail beat is vertically well above that. So this interaction didn't happen just because the tail was already clear of it before it began that next tail beat. So in addition to breaking down kind of these stroke by stroke hydrodynamic interactions, we can also quantify the cumulative momentum transfer using the hydrodynamic impulse. So this is the cross product of the position of a position vector, which we took as the centroid of the fish and the vorticity vector. And what we found was that there was good agreement between this hydrodynamic impulse 
and the ballistic aerial motion of the fish. So even though impulse is not the total momentum, we saw good agreement with the trajectory in all of the cases, which gave us some indication that we could compare the impulse between these cases as a proxy for the total momentum transfer. We also saw that the cumulative impulse increases with jump height, but there's a lot of variation at the individual tailbeat levels. It's not that one behavior dominates over the total jump trajectory. Each of these propulsive motions has an impact. And we also found that whether or not there was an anal fin caudal fin interaction, we didn't really see a difference between those two cases and the impulse. So I'm gonna wrap up for today by talking about the pectoral fins because we took a slightly different approach to determining their contributions. So as we saw at jump onset, the pectoral fins kind of sweep outward and then down. And our 2D PIV measurements suggest that there's some thrust contribution associated with this behavior. But you might notice we only picked that up in about half of the, the flow. Um, and this proved to be really challenging to measure by PIV because it's both really close to the body, so even more occluded than our other fins. And we're also looking over a different kind of length and time scale than our full body waves. So it was very difficult to get a PIV system with enough dynamic range to get this as well as everything else we wanted to measure. So what we did was some uh, collaborative work looking at two phase flow simulations that we could initialize with our experiment kinematics. So we did this work in collaboration with Fotis Sotiropoulos and some of his colleagues at Stony Brook University, um, as well as some folks at Hanyang University. And we took two sets of kinematics to initialize these simulations, both a body midline and a pectoral fin trajectory. And we took all of these kinematics and developed an algorithm to deform a 3D scan of the fish body to match the curvature of our midline as well as the pectoral fin trajectory. And we found we had really good agreement with earlier PIV experiments from these simulations. And since we didn't have the same imaging, optical access and uh, resolution constraints we did with PIV, we were able to really clearly resolve the, the vortex wake of those pectoral fins. And since this was a simulation, we could also directly calculate forces and we found that the pectoral fins do increase thrust at both the start of the abduction, so when they extend, and the adduction when they sweep down. And we found that the drag increases from the pectoral fins at other times during this motion were smaller and shorter duration. So being mindful of the time, I'm going to wrap up here. Um, what we've seen is that jumping archer fish are really remarkable and that they can achieve a near surface acceleration as well as a lot of stability and accuracy through multi fin propulsion. And I know this is a very bio inspired audience. So the point I want to leave you with today is actuator versatility. Um, being able to vary the kinematics is really valuable, and that's what enables the archer fish to have a lot of the performance that it has. Um, specifically, being able to execute multiple interactions in a high performance scenario with one set of actuators. And that no single kinematic moment is really responsible for the jump trajectory. So again, having versatile actuators is really key and having a little extra help during the initial acceleration is also really crucial. I wanna acknowledge everyone who was in the experimental hydrodynamics lab at MIT while I was completing a lot of this work, as well as some collaborators at the London Museum of Natural History, Stony Brook University, and Hanyang University. And I also wanna acknowledge um, all of my current students in the flow imaging lab at MUD who are working on kind of extending some of these ideas and taking them in some new directions. Um, in the past year, uh, doing a lot of tinkering in their garages as we've been remote. 
And with that, I will take any questions. And I know we're a little tight on time here, so feel free to email me if you need to run or just get off Zoom as quickly as possible. Um, because I know we're all we're all feeling the Zoom these days. Yeah, thanks, Leah, for this uh, really nice presentation. The, the cool videos uh, you share and uh, uh, the image processing algorithm enabling this uh, research seems really fascinating. Yeah, thanks. So now uh, it seems Professor Giacomi has a question you can ask. Wow, Leah, where to start? That was fantastic. Um, I love the stunning videos and uh, you know, to the extent that the fluid mechanics is about stunning video, this uh, doesn't get any better than this. Your paper in Physics of Fluids in 2020 didn't use the integral multimedia files, but uh, anyways, I hope you'll submit to Physics of Fluids again. And, and then when you do, you can incorporate your videos, you know, Harry Potter style right into the papers. Oh, that's fun. So look, I have, some, I have some questions for you. Um, the first one was provoked by that first video you showed where the you had the you had the fish i think it was in a mangrove looked like uh, the north shore of singapore to me yeah it, yeah definitely a mangrove but it, but it can't be the north shore of singapore because you said brackish water and i think uh, that's the pacific uh, ocean there right so in any event uh, here's my question is there any convection going on in there or is that just a pond so to the best of my knowledge, I mean, it's a true brackish environment. Um, you do see them a lot of times where streams meet the ocean. So I would imagine you have all of the normal, normal transport you see at, at that brackish, um, that freshwater saltwater interface. Which brings me to the, the reason why I'm asking this is can, can, can that fish, you use the word hovering, Stage. It was like your second or last slide, but that, that question has been in my mind for your whole talk there. Can, can that fish hover? Can it, can, like your experiments were in a, were in a fish tank, but I'm, I'm guessing it needs to stay geostationary with its eyes locked on that target when it spits, right? Yes. So does, yes. It, does, it, does it have the ability to, to combat convection before it spits? By yes, hovering. It, it does hover. Um, it's mostly pectoral dri driven, fin driven station keeping. So sort of a, a an oscillating pedaling of the arms and then a really slow um, tail beat. Um, since our tank was stationary, we didn't see as much of it. Um, but something I didn't talk about is we actually had to train these fish to jump before we, we did any of these experiments. Like we, we reinforced jumping and disincentivized spitting. Um, so when they were jumping in their home tank, you would see a lot more of that hovering and station keeping um, because there were more, more currents and more, more convective flow in that home tank from, from filtration and heating. Is, uh, it seems to me the hovering would be, would be just as exciting to explore. Is that, is that, is that part of your plan? Uh, we didn't look at it with, with these sets of fish um, because kinematically it is very similar to, to other pectoral fin driven hovering. Like I think Georgia Ladder has done some work looking at this in uh, hovering in bluegill sunfish. Um, so okay. we didn't emphasize it because it's kinematically similar, but it would be, it would be interesting to think about in the future. Cause again, you, you have a free surface there and everything changes when you're that close to a free surface. So at the front end of your talk, you, you taught us that you, you had to use light that they couldn't see, but, um, but, uh, since your work is largely curiosity driven, how could you resist putting the green sheet in too and see see what they would do? Don't, yeah. don't you think that that would be cool if if it's easy? It might be cool to see how the fish re react to to uh, the green sheet, and and then it might be not at all. In which case, the green sheet sometimes produces some cool imagery too that the that the other colors don't. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, so it wasn't in our in our animal protocol. So um, again, like since these are live animals, um, we we emphasized like minimizing animal discomfort during experiments, and the oh. your IR imaging was part of that. I see. So I, the green you know, sheet, the the green sheet might uh, stress them, annoy them, or even harm them. Exactly, um, and again, I, like, 
archer fish are really visually sensitive. Like there's a lot of work on like their retina structure and what lets them see through that water air interface. Um, so we definitely weren't going to risk risk doing either harm or provoking the fish with this this harsher light source. Nadis, yeah, I'm hogging all the time here, but I have um, <clears throat> one last question. Uh, but others should go before me if their hands are up. Uh, Leah, it uh, sounds like I get to go with my last question. So can you put a picture of the fish up again, the archer fish for us, if that's easy? But I believe I spotted, uh, there's another fin. I, you may have mentioned it, but isn't there a, there's another fin on this thing, isn't there? there... Yes, they do have a pelvic fin. Um, and we, we didn't really emphasize it again for some of the dynamic range reasons. So I've got my cursor over the pelvic fin now. I'm not sure yeah. if you can see it, but uh, like we didn't really emphasize it in the PIV because it left the measurement volume so quickly. And it's also a lot smaller than the anal fins. So dynamic yeah. range comes into play. Like you're only gonna get a couple of vectors along the length of that fin. Um, but what's interesting is it does, uh, it does extend at jump onset. So like we think there might be some stabilization happening there, but we weren't able to, to resolve it super well to, to support or, or deny that. Yeah, beautiful work, uh, Leah. Thank you. So yeah. it seems we yeah. have some, yeah. Oh, Leah, actually I have a question. So, um, so oh, some people like maybe go before me, mm -hmm. so. Uh, yeah, uh, so, a... okay, uh, I, I, should I just go like a next? Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay, I was, I was just, it's just a quick question. So like, um, um, talking about hovering, it's remind me another fish, which is a radar fish. It's a very long slender, like, you know, they not like a swimming as like, you know, uh, longitudinal, they like swimming like, you know, this, like, you know, like a razor blade. So mm -hmm. the way they, they, they change their position and the way they like maneuver, they actually find that they actively change their like center of mass by like changing the like, you know, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the air in their body, like you know, accordingly. So uh, that's also the question, like when, I, when you mentioned that the razor, uh, sorry, archfish, like when they close to the free surface, they basically stationary being there and they also can change their body angle. Um, it's more like a dynamic, like, like, you know, balance, or they also change their body internally, something like a, to actually like you know, distribute their weight or distribute their points, like, you know, center points, so in a way to keep like a certain, certain position. So. Yeah, so they, they do have a swim bladder. Um, we, we weren't necessarily able to measure how active that swim bladder was during, um, during hovering, but, but it's certainly possible that there was some activity there. Um, the time scale of the hovering is just a couple minutes though. Um, so depending on how quickly it can execute a buoyancy change um, would, be, would be interesting to think about there. Um, clearly we just need to do some, some X-ray imaging on top of our nine high-speed cameras so that we can get the swim bladder in there too. <laughs> Okay, it's not that difficult, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. So, so it seems we have a, uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, excuse my pronunciation, Mahid Hassan Khan. You want to ask the question yourself, or I can? Uh, I can, help I can you. ask. I can ask. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, ahead. Leah. Amazing presentation. I have three questions. One is with regard to the fish, and two about your three D PIV. So the fish, when it leaves the surface, uh, we still see the strokes. So does the, I mean, do those strokes have to do something with balancing the body in the projectile? Um, yeah, that's our, our latest hypothesis. Um, so when we did the, the computational work on this, um, we were actually able to uh, resolve, we were actually able to resolve the, the vortical structures in air as well. Um, and we, we were able to do the same sort of thrust calculation we did with the pectoral fins when we were in air. Um, and we, did, we didn't find any, any thrust. So it's likely that it's either, either small reorientations of the center of gravity or 
the fish just doesn't know that it's not in water and it is doing its thing. Um, so has your the, this a new computational work come out or we have to wait it, uh, wait for it to read it? Um, well, um, the the vortical structures in air were in our uh, 2020 physics of fluids paper. Okay, okay. I think I missed it then. <laughs> I, I have two questions regarding your PIV. So you mentioned that uh, when you take these many uh, planes, then you have this constellation of defocused images, which are basically a reflection of uh, the camera arrangement. So or do you, because I was developing a 3D PIV system, I couldn't get publishable quality thing. So I generally used to take the size of this constellation or arrangement of cameras for the depth component. So are you taking the same or is it something different? So we haven't used the, the constellation in the same way that say, say defocusing PIV would, where you have you use the constellation size as an indicator of, of depth. And that's that's mostly because of the occlusion. Like if we're not guaranteed to find the full constellation, then um, you you definitely need to look into more how much you can use that partial constellation for for depth. Mm -hmm. So you reconstruct the 3D uh, particle arrangement and then do cross correlation. Yep. Okay, thank you, thank you. And yep. the last one, your cameras seem to have some of the cameras were very translationally arranged and the corner ones were at certain angle. So are those arrangements uh, based on some shame flow principle like Tomo PIV or is it uh, a different arrangement, especially so the corner cameras? Yeah, so the governing principle is uh, baseline spacing, so just distance between cameras. Um, and that's in uh, Jesse Belden's 2010 paper on kind of the, the principles of synthetic aperture PIV. Mm -hmm. um, we don't use a shine fluke adapter. Instead, we just typically um, set our F number such that we have enough depth of field that we don't get, we don't, we don't necessarily run into the, the limitation of of being really off axis. Oh, nice, nice. Thank you. Thank you. An amazing presentation. Thank you for the presentation. So. Hey, so any more questions? Okay, so if no more questions, uh, then let's uh, thank Leah again for his uh, for her great talk. And uh, we will meet uh, for the next week. Right. See you guys. Thanks, Leo. Say Thank hi to all. Jacob again. Say bye-bye. Thank you, Leo. Thank you.